Hello everyone, welcome to Room and Board. My name is Chris George, and today I wanted to have a conversation. A table talk, as it were. A gab with my gal pals. A dish on the ish with this bish. I'm sorry. But I wanted to bring up my thoughts in this particular subject, and in true table talk format. If I get enough responses in the comments, I'll compile those and create a table talk back video. And that way, if you'll allow me to channel that big Rodney energy for a moment, we can all participate in the conversation. But I wanted to talk about money and the direction that I see the board game hobby going. I guess the question I want to ask or bring up for discussion among various questions is this. Are board games becoming too expensive? And this will obviously vary depending on the individual, your interests, how much disposable income you have, a number of different factors. And let me be clear from the start, I am not trying to say don't spend money on board games. That's not what this is about. And I don't spend money on anything. I spend it on food, rent, business expenses, and board games. That's it. I love spending money on board games because they are the things that bring me some of the greatest joy in life. And when I'm also able to share that joy and create and share fun experiences with people I love, that to me is money well spent. But all of those things can be true, and board games can still be incredibly expensive. And what prompted this video was a number of factors. One being I wanted to create some content focused on one of my favorite games of all time, Rising Sun, because I love it and want to talk about it. But at retail, it's $110 Canadian, $100 US. And to me, that's expensive. Maybe I'm feeling this more since I'm actively recommending the game. And then ISS Vanguard opened up for late pledges, where they have an all-in gameplay of $250 US or an all-in all-in of $550 US, and that is, is quite expensive. And then I was watching a Board Game Co. video where he said that he spent around $800 on Marvel United, and I thought, oh, that can't possibly be true. And I went to the Kickstarter page and I added it all up, and on their last Kickstarter for the X-Men, you can spend $680 if you get everything that they have there, plus you still need to get the base game, plus I can only assume over $100 in shipping for those 18 plus boxes. So this is what sort of prompted this thought on this topic. But Chris, I hear you saying, there are plenty of other ways where you can spend a ridiculous amount of money on various things. That's true, like this $1650 gold backpack or this $70,000 pizza. So why not spend money on things that I like? And if it's too much, well, you don't have to buy it. And I completely agree. What is money for if not to support the creation of things that bring you joy? If you want it and can afford it, get it. And I guess the question here shifts then from are board games too expensive to when do we stop? And perhaps more interestingly, if this trend continues, are we potentially alienating drawing new people into the hobby if every game starts to require such an intense investment? And I don't know. On the one hand, this seems like a silly concern because there are tons of games at a lower price point which provide great value. Not every game has to be hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I get that. On the other hand, in this hobby, there's a tendency to focus on the cult of the new. And it's these large, expansive worlds with huge production values that seem to get more and more of our attention over perhaps the more reasonably valued alternatives. And if that's what we are consistently giving our attention to and showing that we value these sorts of games over more accessible ones, I say accessible in terms of price, then doesn't it only make sense that more and more games will start to follow this trend in order to become profitable, a la Marvel United, which is a lightweight family game that you can spend $800 on. And I know that's come on and all of their Kickstarters you can spend $500 on. But I wonder, will we see publishers, other publishers, going this route? Or needing to go this route in order to make a profit? I know Z-Man Games recently relinquished the rights to republish Princes of Florence, which is a game that I really, really enjoy and I own, because they didn't see a road to profitability. And this is on a reprint of a really solid game. Now, it takes a lot for a board game to become profitable. There's a lot that I didn't know before making this video, and still don't, about the behind the scenes economics that go into publishing a board game. And it was astounding for me to realize the breakdown of how little 
the publishers and designers actually get of that MSRP price. There's a great article that I read by Mechanics and Meeples, I'll uh, link to that in the description below, which I really encourage to read if you're more interested about the economics of publishing a game and the effects that tariffs can have on game prices. And it goes into this all in detail, step by step, through all the people that have to be paid in order to get the game onto your shelf. But one of my main takeaways was that it was amazing for me to realize that publishers and designers seem to be making less than the retailers who are selling the game at a local store level. And I know there are many more factors to consider here. Retailers have to pay for storefront space, warehouse space. Not every unit is gonna sell for MSRP. Some are gonna be on the sales rack, pay for the employees. You need to have extra capital so that you can buy more stock so that you can sell at a profit and keep that cash flow going. I'm not trying to slam the retailer here for potentially making more money than the designers and the publishers, because obviously there is a cost associated with everything and their costs are greater as well. But reading this article by Mechanics and Meeples made me almost reconsider posting this video in the first place, because if that's the case, if these are the unshakable costs of producing and publishing a game through the regular channels and the publishers make only about one fifth of the MSRP price, maybe games aren't expensive enough. Maybe we should be charging more so that those who invented the games that I love can continue to create more games that I might love. I don't know, what do you think? I don't have a business degree and there are a lot of moving parts. And then there's a part of me that wishes that I knew the exact percentage that companies are able to make off of Kickstarter or through pre-orders when they don't have to factor in the whole retail component of the supply chain. Because that part of me feels like I want to determine the amount of profit that they make from me for this game. Which when you think about it, that's <laughs> kind of a crappy attitude to have. Does it matter how much they're making? I mean, I guess if you feel like you're getting ripped off by the publisher, but more likely they're charging enough so that they can continue to produce games and give all of their employees a livable wage. And so that part of me feels a little hypocritical as well. And if I really wanted to support a company that's creating things that I love, I'll pay those costs and I should be happy that more of my money is going towards them when I pre-order or go through Kickstarter rather than wanting a larger deal, which when I start to think about it that way, the question then becomes, should price matter at all? But of course it does. Of course it does. Unless you have an infinite amount of money, price will most likely always be a factor. I will still naturally attempt to quantify the experience that I get in the box whenever I hold a game. The article that I mentioned uses Wingspan as an example. And for me, I think Wingspan is the best example of a perfect value for a game. It's a great game, it's great component quality, it's under 60 bucks, it's $55 Canadian. I don't think anyone can complain that you're not getting your money's worth when you buy Wingspan. Conversely, if we compare that with something like Terraforming Mars, which is $5 more, you get significantly less quality components, tons of empty space in the box, player mats that are almost universally reviled for how cheap they feel. I look at the two of these games and I think, how does Wingspan cost less than Terraforming Mars? And I think it's natural to make these sorts of comparisons. They're both board games, they're both around the same price. I think Terraforming Mars gets away with it because it is such a solid game. But when I look at what Wingspan was able to do for a similar price point, I can't help but think, come on, you couldn't give me five double layered player boards? And I know this type of thinking discounts all the back-end elements that I've recently attempt to consider more and more, but the reality is the average consumer's not gonna care. They're gonna look inside a box and say, did I get enough stuff for this price? So where do we even start to assign value to do this comparison on price? Terraforming Mars, a game lasts two times as long. Does that make it worth more? What combination of components and design do we consider or should we consider when factoring in how much a game costs and deciding if that game is too expensive? And are we getting a significant enough increase the higher we go? Again, I don't know. These are the things that I'm starting to consider. Like I said, I want this to be a conversation and I'm really interested in what you all think about these sorts of questions. I'm also curious, what's the most you've spent on a board game without regretting a single penny of it? How much is too much to spend on a game regardless of the experience it provides? At the end of the day, I'd much rather pay more for games 
than have people stop making them. And if the added price tag does allow the hobby to grow, well, that's great. Keep jacking it up. <laughs> because it is hard to put a price on experiences, and that's essentially what we're investing in. Whether it's for $20 or $200, we're investing in an experience that we can share with our friends and family around the table. And those experiences are priceless. Even though the components may not be. <laughs> I'm going to end it there for now. If this sparked any thoughts in you, please share them in the comments below. I look forward to hearing from you all and revisiting this in about a week's time. Also, if you found this video somewhat interesting, make sure to like and subscribe like every good YouTuber tells you to. But until next time, thanks for watching.